Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 13 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and joining me once again is my good friend, Pervez Ahmed. Thank you, Zaki. Good to be here. Uh, happy, uh, happy Muslim New Year to everyone, uh, and also a new year for us. We so, This is the year of the scorpion, I believe. <laughs> No, <laughs> I don't know. No. I am. I'm a Scorpio. Maybe. Oh, okay. No. Yeah, yeah. So and obviously, I have no knowledge of, of things that I really should know about. Uh, so we we have a, a, a very uh, exciting episode coming up for you. We, we uh, hopefully uh, lots of laughs and lots of deep thinking. Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks to everybody who listened to our last episode. We were very pleasantly surprised that uh, you enjoyed hearing just the two of us talk to each other. Didn't think we'd have the traction, but yeah. the numbers show otherwise. So. Yeah. So you know what that means? No more guests. From now on, it's just us. And we're not even going to talk about important stuff. We're going to talk about whatever. That's right. What we did that morning. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Remember, you asked for it. <laughs> Uh, I am kidding, of course. We actually have a a, a very packed episode right now, so, so this totally flies in the face of what I just said. Yeah. And and to start things off, uh, I wanted to share my interview with a comedian of note, uh, who some of you who listen to the show I'm sure are familiar with, and that is uh, John Stewart, host of The Daily Show, who I had an opportunity to chat with uh, in regards to the new film that he directed called Rosewater, which is about... Uh, events uh, stemming from the 2009 uh, elections in Iran, which saw a journalist named Maziar Bahari uh, actually thrown in jail uh, and charged with espionage because he gave an interview to The Daily Show. Right. So uh, a lot of interesting stuff there. Now, now, I just want to point out here that, you know, as, as a blogger for, for 10 years now, I have... Uh, written about The Daily Show, or written about Jon Stewart, or posted videos from Jon Stewart's show uh, uh, more than 150 times. So Jon Stewart's been a huge uh, factor in tr- sort of just shaping my my view of, of geopolitics and certainly my sense of humor. So the chance to sit and chat with him was, was uh, I gotta be honest, I, I kind of fanboyed out a little oh, yeah. bit. Right. Well, I mean, color me totally jealous because I unfortunately could not uh, could not be there with Zucky, uh, but uh, totally proud of the fact that Zucky was able to 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 to, to have that moment with John Stewart, uh, and we're just really excited to, uh, like I said, or me personally, just very excited to be able to have this on our podcast by virtue of the fact that Zucky was invited and they reached out to Zucky to sit down with John Stewart and talk about the new movie. Yeah, have you so, seen the new movie, by the way? I, I have seen it, okay. and uh, you know, it's it's um, uh, he's an impressive director. I got to say, he, he he directed this film, and uh, his first uh, first go behind the camera, right? First go behind the camera, and uh, he's he. I can I can easily see a scenario where he eventually transitions out of the Daily Show and uh, could could very comfortably do something like this. It's it's uh, very confident. First, first stab at directing. Excellent. And I share your thoughts in terms of like just John Stewart and The Daily Show informing so much of my, you know, uh, just yeah, political attitudes and, and, and whatnot. So, or, you know, and my assessment of and how, or so much of what my, you know, of, or has informed so much of how I view not only the political spectrum, but also, you know, the role of media and, and, and the, uh, the sort of abysmal state of our, uh, of our media here in this country. So. Yeah. So so with that, uh, let's uh, cut to uh, my, my roundtable interview with Jon Stewart. So you will hear me along with some of my fellow colleagues uh, as we quiz him about Rosewater uh, and his inspirations as a filmmaker. And uh, uh, what do you think of MySpace? <laughs> so let's go ahead and play that. Uh, John, in the press notes, you mentioned that uh, there was you, you felt a certain amount of, of guilt uh, uh, in terms of that was a motivating factor in doing this story. I was wondering if you could elaborate on that and maybe uh, ex- talk about what was going through your mind when you found out what had happened to Maziar and sort of the role right. that. Uh, you I mean, I think that's you know, I, we we joke about that to some extent. You know, it's it's not that. We, it was more concern than guilt. Uh, obviously, and I hate to, to spoiler alert this, but generally we're not actually in the places we say we are at the Daily Show. It's usually a, it's a picture that we're standing in front of, and I probably shouldn't be giving that away. 
generally, we are we are not actually traveling to these war zones. Uh, so this is one of the first times that we've ever done that, and, and to have all the individuals that we had interviewed be arrested, obviously within the context though of a much larger authoritarian crackdown in a culture. So it's not that we were unaware. It, we did not think, oh my God, three people that we interviewed are arrested and no one else, so this is correlation equals causation. You know, this it, it's, it, We didn't feel that. We felt a concern that something that we might be doing would be damaging to helping them get out or was there something on the flip side that we could do that could help them get out and we were actually probably more in touch with another gentleman Ibrahim Yazdi's family who had also been arrested his family uh, his son lived in New Jersey so he came on the program to talk about his father's case and they were urging and all the people that were working on Maziar's behalf were urging us to continue talking about what had happened during that time and, and to keep trying to bring attention to it. Um, and that's sort of one of the, I think, one of the reasons Masiar was so keen on getting the story out is you want to, th- there are so many people now who are in this same situation and you want to get that, you want to publicize their plight more than, than bury it. Your original vision for this film was a little bit harsher, but because I had to pull back due to financing and try to walk out a little... I don't know if it was harsher. I or think it was darker, maybe? In terms of the story? In terms of darker? getting the film and your vision for the film as opposed to... No, no, it was more, I think, originally when, when we spoke of it, I thought there, you know, there was sort of this idea of it being in farce. Mm. But not, certainly not darker. And that's the same point. Uh, right? but, but having a, a different tint to it and... and Maziar's, which I thought was a really good point, was uh, don't you don't you want people to see it? <laughs> and uh, so that that ended up you know pushing us in a different direction. Well, having said that, I mean, what's uh, how delicate of a line did you have to walk to figure out you know this is what I want to do versus this is what would be more commercially acceptable, so to speak? It, it's not so much that it was commercially acceptable; it's that the, the best way to tell the story with integrity. Hmm. Uh, the truth is, uh, and you may not know this, I am not fluent in that language. So to direct a film in that way, the, sure? the, the height of presumption and, and, and hubris. There are great Iranian filmmakers who could make uh, that film. This was going to be uh, sort of a reflection of the source material, which was Maziar's book, uh, and, and 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 this was just uh, the best iteration of telling that story that, that I could accomplish. So. It, there's a part in the film where, you know, there's... Uh, I haven't seen it, so you're... You haven't seen it, <laughs> I'll be specific. Um, for both of you, I guess I'm curious as to what you guys think social media does in these sort of political movements. Does it benefit or is it a burden? I mean, the, the part that I'm talking about in the movie you haven't seen, of course, is um, <laughs> the hashtags. Sure. Of saying. And in this case, it's like this is a very helpful where there's oppression, there's censorship, and this is... Uh, help, but generally speaking, to get you involved, it's definitely not a burden. I mean, I cannot uh, imagine it to be a burden. Some people had some issues with Facebook and Twitter, and Google Plus was not around, unfortunately, at that time. That you know, that uh, intelligence agencies can get people's information through Facebook or Twitter, but. That's not a big issue. People they can uh, they can do it through other means as well. But I think social media, uh, Twitter, Facebook, they are expediting this movement, this social movement, this nonviolent resistance movements all around the world. Not only in Iran, it actually started maybe in Iran that the first time for the first time, social media played a role in a movement. But uh, since then, we've seen it in Arab Spring, in different countries, Tunisia, Egypt, and also Syria, and Libya. We saw it in Hong Kong. We saw it in Ukraine. Because the social media is about information. It's about sharing information, sharing data. And sharing information and sharing data is a democratizing factor. And for these authoritarian states, for this dictatorship, it's a scary phenomenon. So they are scared of information. They are scared of free flow of information. So social media, I think, we just see the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen in 10 years, 20 years' time, but I'm sure because of the social media, this pace of change will be expedited. I think it's also important to try and view it through its strengths and its limitations. Um, It's an excellent way for people to organize, to gather, to spread information. That being said, it's limited in its efficacy 
in terms of building the types of lasting civic institutions and structures that you need to, you know, uh, uh, that need to be in place for the, the, those information technologies to be effective as, as a way of, it's, it's not just about getting people onto the street, then you have to have something that's going to fill that, that power vacuum or whatever it is that, that you want to use as your reform. Yeah, it's a medium. We cannot expect social media to right. bring you electricity, pick up your garbage, right. Right. do the policing. It's just a medium. But you'd rather you know, live in a world with it than without it. Oh, definitely. Sure. Yeah. But it's like saying you'd rather live in a world without phones. I mean, it's, now, now, yeah, it's, right. it's, now it is, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's one of those ways in which and people always say this about television, you know, there are all these different platforms, and you're like, yeah, but the important thing is always going to be content. Right. And the reason why social media, I think, is effective within authoritarian regimes is they're built to stop more conventional means. So what social media allowed for was agility. Mm-hmm. It allowed for uh, a, a, a spontaneity and agility that the, the regimes could not catch up to. And that allowed for, it, it leveled the playing field to some extent, from uh, uh, the powerful to those that were seeking to, to get out on the street. As it grows, as it becomes more sophisticated, people will understand how to utilize it better. But in general, I view it all as, uh, you know, you, you, you always have to gather information actively and not passively. And, you know, it's another tool that allows you to further shade the information that, that you are aggregating and that you are gathering and that you are consuming and that, uh, you know, it, it's like anything else. Have a healthy diet. Get, get a good amount of social media, a good amount of, of more uh, maybe long-form journalism. Uh, throw in a little bit of TV. Oh, you want a little dessert? I think the voice is on. You know, something like that. <laughs> but but uh, all I'm saying is I think it, it, it has become a part of... Uh, the daily routine, but it also has to be filtered through whatever prism that you're putting all your other information in. And I'm a, I mean, very active user of both Twitter and Facebook. I don't use it for personal information since I came out because of I don't know security reasons and because I'm just a very private person. I don't like I don't like to put personal information on Facebook or Twitter. So you don't expect me to see my pet or you know my food you know on Facebook or Twitter. He's just a big four square. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the thing where you can become the mayor of, of the place you go to? There's some Foursquare. Foursquare, Foursquare. Foursquare. that's right. <laughs> he's, he's the mayor of I the place. I can't be No, definitely not good. I'm thinking on Google. It's like talking to a lot. Yeah. I, I got nothing. <laughs> when I like this MySpace. <laughs> that's booming right now. Yeah. I know. When MySpace is a space like the abandoned amusement park of the internet. Sure. Well, you see also the pace of change. You know, the, the these these kingdoms are built and destroyed in, in a matter of a couple of years in a way that the turnover is incredible. When it comes to comedy, it's pretty much every night you see, I see, from my perspective, you have Seinfeld, Alan, Bruce, all kind of blending into your influences there very well. And uh, I'm interested in directing is your first time. Mm-hmm. Are you, were you looking at someone? Are you influenced by someone in particular? I mean, the truth is I was most influenced by Maziar. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and his story, I mean, that the source material there, as far as the visualizations of it, the intention was to create a palette that the story could live in without, with, with, without the palette itself drawing your eye. Hmm. So the, the question was to kind of create a, a quiet, obviously, inauthenticity, because we weren't in Iran, we were in, in Jordan. And, and, but, but so that it... it it, it environmentally and and accent wise and all those other things lived in a world that wasn't discordant, so that you could focus on on the narrative of it. So, in other words, you know, when the prison was not to be a dungeon, even though that I think the expectation from from many Westerners about you know he has been held in a Middle Eastern prison. Oh, well, that must be underground. There must be no lights. And rats are running around. And, Certainly no dancing. Yeah. And <laughs> no dancing, but it is, you know, Evan Prison is not that. It's a, it's a bureaucratic institution, much mm-hmm. like, like uh, hospitals. They clean the floors. You know, it's not, you, you don't view it as uh, Dante's Inferno. It's, it's a bureaucracy. The food is much better than most airlines. Yeah. Really? <laughs> Doesn't say much. But. Yeah. And you have to keep your seat, obviously, in the upright and line position. Oh, okay. I keep that. 
Well, hitting on that, I mean, you've obviously been interviewing filmmakers and celebrities for years now, but mm-hmm. subconsciously, did you want to step behind the camera, or did it just, just happen? And if so, how did you tackle things on set as a first-time director? Right. I mean, it, it was it was not this. It was a relatively organic process that grew out of our collaboration early on from the book and, and trying to produce the film, and and not knowing our way necessarily around that process, and not being so aware of how glacial it is, <laughs> and wanting this film to be seen in this century, as opposed to you know, uh, it, it was on you know obviously we didn't have any money and. The writers that we love, and, and we had this great list of people that had won many awards, uh, but who were apparently busy being paid for other shit. <laughs> uh, so this, this, this was a question of, I think, ultimately feeling like this is a, a very relevant and urgent issue and, and wanting it to be made and, and wanting to maintain a certain amount of creative control over the process because I think we both felt very strongly about about the aspects of it that we and we didn't want to relent that to a larger entity that may have a very different take on it like what if Maziar was actually a lesbian and wasn't in a prison was actually in a rodeo you know trying to make it more commercial or Mexican as opposed more, more to yeah. oh, that's the yeah. sequel yeah. 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 but I think it came out of a mutual trust because from right. the beginning I mean of course I was a fan of the Daily Show so I trusted that you know that image of John and you know his political point of view. But then you know when we got to know each other, you know I think there was mutual trust and working on the script together. So I think eventually John had a lot of emotional and you know um, how can I say time investment in the in the material. So we did not want to hand it to someone else who would right. ruin it. So. You know, the process of writing it was organic, and then out of that group, the directing it. Right. Uh, is there one question you wish would go away? Something that maybe keeps constantly being asked, and you're like, yeah, hey. boxers or shorts, you know. <laughs> in general, I mean, I found that in general, you know, people are, are very well versed in the subject matter. Uh, they seem invested in the story. I haven't felt. Uh, if there's something that keeps coming up, something that maybe was reductive or crass or something else. Yes, one thing that I guess uh, annoys us I guess, uh, is that why there are, there are no Iranian actors. Maybe oh, oh, is, no. Yeah, if mm-hmm. someone insists on that, but, yeah. yeah. But it's, that is, really. it's a reasonable. It's it's yeah. a reasonable yeah. it's a question. question yeah. Yeah. You know. Okay. So there we go. So so that that uh, um, obviously uh, Ro- Rosewater is uh, in theaters uh, very shortly. By by the time you are listening to this, it's, so people it's, are going to ask. Well, I mean, obviously you, you got some time with him one on one. How is he as a person? Nice guy. Uh, he is just as witty and wise as you would hope. Wow. And I say that as somebody who's and this is not like uh, I'm not trying to sound gross by talking about all the. You know, quote unquote celebrities that I've met. It's, that's I'm not trying to do that, but uh, I've met enough people yeah. where you know you you're impressed with some, and you're kind of like, all right. With uh, I mean, I haven't met anybody who was just a, a you know a, a total nightmare. Thank goodness. But uh, John Stewart was definitely one of those like fanboy moments. For mm. me, you know, so so that was a, a highlight. Absolutely. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. I, yeah. I got a selfie with John Stewart. So yes, yes. Know. Well, which we'll also link to, I think, on our Facebook page. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll now post that it there. Yeah. you can check that. Out. So definitely check out Rosewater uh, in theaters. Uh, it is in theaters a week from when we are recording. So let me pull that. Okay, so it's it's in theaters on the fourteenth yeah. uh, of November, and we're currently recording on the sixth. Yeah. So definitely go and check that out. Uh, and like Zucky said at the outset, we had we had a we have a pretty packed show. So in addition to the uh, what you just heard, we also were able to sit down and have a very engaging conversation with uh, Dean Obedullah. And and yeah, Dean, Dean is a, a comedian, uh, but before he was a comedian, he was a, he was a lawyer, yeah. and uh, he 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 did what most lawyers uh, tend to do, which is stop being lawyers. Is what I'm finding. Uh, so so he he's sort of made his bones as not just a comedian, but also that seems to be like a running theme. Sorry, uh, sorry to say that. Sorry to br- interrupt you. In terms of lawyers, turns anything else. So, so Pervez, attorney That's at right. law, okay. uh, how often, how, how, how long before you are, uh, I know. Uh, you know, writing, well, I, writing slam poetry? Right? right, well, I'm trying this go at podcasting, who knows, maybe it can turn it into a gig. 
<laughs> what he's saying is go to our Kickstarter page and uh, say Bismillah. Right, right. Uh, no, but like, think about it. Gamran Pasha, right? Attorney turned uh, screenwriter uh, and novelist. And we've had Ali Etaraz uh, more recently, a lawyer turned... Uh, Poet uh, turned novelist. <laughs> novelist, that's right. Yeah, of course, Wajahat Ali. Wajahat who Ali, who we'll want to have, right? But uh, then, uh, then we've had like bona fide attorneys, like Zahra Bilu, who's who's still lawyer. <laughs> that's right. That's so, right. I really don't know what point we're trying to make. <laughs> where, is that, I just mean we've had a, it's been an interesting running theme. Sorry, go ahead. You were talking there, about there Dean. are a lot of Muslim lawyers. There you go. All right. <laughs> so so uh, Dean has appeared on on US television, international television. He's been on Comedy Central's Axis of Evil comedy tour. He's been on The View. He's been on CNN. Uh, he's also been on MSNBC. Uh, he's the director of a new documentary. Well, it's not a new documentary per se. Uh, it's, it's a little bit older now, but uh, it's on Netflix. Uh, so check it out. It's called The Muslims Are Coming. And uh, that features a tour of American Muslim comedians mm-hmm. performing free comedy shows across the South and West, and it features, speaking of John Stewart, it also features uh, John Stewart in there. So uh, uh, we were very lucky to have the opportunity to chat with, with Dean, and now just to sort of set the con- set, yeah. to set the mood, if you will, uh, we should have like ocean sounds playing in the background, <laughs> but uh, Dean came into the Bay Area, yeah. and, and he was uh, 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 serving as a, uh, a, a keynote. panelist, a right. keynote speaker, excuse yeah. me, for, for the Islamic Scholarship Fund for, for the dinner that they had, yeah. and so... Uh, I, I had a, I had the chance to pick Dean up from the airport, and I brought him to the hotel, and we we chatted with him in the cafe in the hotel. And so so what you're gonna see is, here? What, what, excuse me, what you're gonna hear? No, what you're gonna see. That's how vivid. <laughs> that's how vivid our right. our conversations. What you're gonna hear is kind yeah. of restaurant ambience, and and. It's it's by design. It's on purpose because we want you to feel like you're there with us. We want you to feel like you're there breaking bread with us and, Literally, and Dean, right. Dean Abedala. So, right. I so, just wish you guys could have paid the bill, but oh well. Yeah. yeah. We'll take <laughs> Th- it again. Thanks for not picking up the check. Yeah. So it, it is like we're friends, basically. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, here is our conversation with uh, Dean Abedala. Dean, thanks for joining us. Sure. Thanks. We're glad to be here. We're uh, uh, having this conversation over lunch, which is a first for our show. That's right. So, kind of a big deal, and, and we're, we, it's worth pointing out we're a few hours away from the uh, banquet for the Islamic Scholarship Fund, where and Dean, you're going to be one of the uh, featured speakers, though. So, uh, so yeah. uh, and one of our past guests, Farhan Tahir, Farhan Tahir, also going to be one of the other speakers, friend of the show, Farhan yeah. Tahir. That's so, right. uh, uh, just just to start things off, I think I think it's helpful. You, you, your journey has been kind of a unique one, bringing you to where you're at now. At, at present, uh, you're certainly one of the most prominent voices that's out there using entertainment, using humor to combat. Uh, Islamophobia. Mm-hmm. Uh, how did you get to where you are now? I have no idea. I really am clueless to how it happened. It was not by design. It was more just, I'd, I'd say, happenstance. Certainly, at one point. I mean, it was really. I'd say, nine eleven was really the triggering point for me and my comedy, talking about being Arab and Muslim. At that time, it was more people were more ignorant, honestly, than a hater on Muslims or on Arabs. But so I wanted to do something and use my comedy as a, as a vehicle to try to make people laugh and point fun at some of the misconceptions people have about our community. And, and that's really where it started out for. And from there, it just grew over time in ways I never expected, frankly. So you were saying that, sorry, prior to 9-11, you were doing comedy. Um, uh, I, I know you have a really interesting sort of background in terms of, uh, like, your your... your you were raised in New Jersey. Mm-hmm. You come from sort of a, like a mixed race uh, yes. parental background as well. You want to talk a little bit about like sure. your Palestinian roots, your right. Italian roots? So yeah. my dad's Palestinian. He was yeah. born in what was then Palestine. Okay. Now it's the West Bank, and he's Muslim. My mom is Italian. She was born here, but her parents are from Sicily. She's Catholic, so I was really raised with both faiths growing up, and it was different races, different cultures, right. different different everything. All coexisting in our home, which to me really represents America at its best. I mean, that's what the melting pot concept is, and that the beauty is that we can all live together. And there's no holy wars, there's no fighting going on in our family. Everyone was cool with everybody else. And my Muslim cousins would come over and we'd celebrate uh, Christmas together and then you know my mom and all of us would go with my cousins for the Eid at the end of Ramadan and so it was really the two worlds together. And many times we were Muslim and, and Catholic cousins all hanging out together growing up. And 
you know, everyone had an accent. The, my Arab cousin from the Middle East and the Jersey people from Jersey they had that accent, which is more difficult to understand for certain people. That's right. Um, so it was nothing to me abnormal. M later in life, when I look back and spoke to others, my experience was more unique yeah. because of two faiths and two cultures and two races. And we had no issues really whatsoever mm -hmm. about anything. We both, what we learned about Catholicism, and Christianity, and Islam simultaneously. It was never an issue one or the other. It was just an interesting upbringing that way. No, certainly. And then I think also in the neighborhood, like the neighborhood you kind of grew up in was also kind of diverse. I mean, there was a big Jewish community, I imagine. And Late, well, I grew up in Lodi, uh -huh. New Jersey, where I was born, so I was eight. Right. There were two ethnic groups. They were either Italian or they were my father. That was the entire diversity. <laughs> when, we, when we moved to Paramus, a few oh, miles Paramus, away, right. that's much more typical suburban New Jersey. Gotcha. Uh, Jews, Italians, Irish. That's the big communities you see in North Jersey, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, especially in, in the Burton County area where I'm from. They were, I didn't know any Arabs or Muslims at all growing up. Mm. There were none, none in Lodi, of course, but none in Paramus. We were the only ones there. Right. And, and being a mixed heritage, being Italian, also, you know, I connected with all the Italians there because that was it. There were no Arabs or Muslims to connect with, just Italians. Wow. So I grew up more identifying as Italian, I think, than Arab. And then that's when 9-11 really made that change for me in my life. And the language spoken at, 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 the, at the house was like English, mostly? Angrily English. It was, it was, it was English and anger. Uh, no, my father would say things in Arabic right. when he was upset, and my mom would say things in Italian when she was upset. But when they weren't angry, they were speaking English. And, okay. and the, I think one of my great regrets is not learning Arabic or Italian fluently. I understand some Italian, I understand some Arabic. And my, my Arabic's gotten better, but because the parents... The common language was English. Yeah. That's what we spoke in English. And my cousins came from Palestine to America. They wanted to learn English. They didn't want to teach me Arabic. So true. So it wasn't until later in life when I made a decision to try to learn some Arabic. But of course, I learned some Arabic growing up, learning prayers in Arabic, of course. And, and you would learn basic things, but no conversations in Arabic. Mm. Now, by, by way of uh, uh, education, so if you're, you're, you're an attorney. Yeah, by uh, but And uh, uh, when did you make the transition into comedy? Well, I started doing comedy soon after being a lawyer. I really didn't enjoy being a lawyer. It was mm -hmm. not fun at all. You need a sense of humor to be. <laughs> really, being a lawyer, yeah. for some people, it was the greatest job. And I almost mm -hmm. was jealous of those people because it wasn't a good fit for me. But I really went into law because I was active in politics, and I just thought it was a good pedigree to have to mm -hmm. run for office, frankly. That was really why. And within about a year or two of being a lawyer, they had the funniest lawyer show. The New Jersey Bar Association, I was practicing in New Jersey and New York, had that. And people in my law firm were like, you know, you should try this because you're not good at lawyering. <laughs> Maybe you'll be good at being funny. And I just did the funniest lawyer show and I enjoyed it, but it was still not a thought to do it for a career. But I really enjoyed the idea that I could talk about issues that I, I talked about being Arab. This is before I love it. I talked yeah. a little bit about being Arab, a little bit about being Italian and having two faiths in our home. And, and political stuff was a big part of my comedy then and it still is. So I thought, this is interesting. I can talk about the issues that I, I'm passionate about. Yeah. And the way that's funny and it's not a speech, but I didn't think about it as a career. It wasn't mm -hmm. until later that I gravitated to like saying, like, maybe I should, I should try to do this. So you, you were doing uh, comedy for how long before 9-11 happened? <coughs> Probably about four or five years. Okay. But it wasn't full time. It was just uh, kind of a thing on the side. He was doing it. I really, I did quit being a lawyer. That's really when my mind, when I really became a full time comedian, even though my living was not made from full time. When I made a choice intellectually, I'm like, this is in my head. I'm not going to be a lawyer anymore. I, I quit and became a page at NBC mm, in like wow. 98. So I've been a lawyer for a couple of years, about three or four years. I quit, became a page, and made ten dollars an hour. Where you do? So you were at Thirty Rock. Yeah, Thirty Rock. You so you were in uniform. I was exactly. I wore the uniform and everything, wow. and with a little pin. Right. And that's a year program. It's like Ken's in it forever. You can't do that. The page program is a one year program. You're out. And either you get a job at NBC or someplace else, mm -hmm. or at the end of the year you're asked to leave. You leave. It terminates. So yeah. one year you're hired for a year. You can leave any time because their goal is to get you a job. Okay. And I wanted to work at Center Night Live. That was my dream, and I was lucky enough to get hired at Center Night Live. And using my legal background, I did rights and clearance for the show. So I did oh, it for like wow. eight years. No doing, kidding. So I worked on the production staff at Center Night Live. This is the late 90s? Like, oh. Well, actually, 99 to like oh, okay. 2005, 2006. But you know, it was on the, yeah. 
Yeah, well, that was a good era. It was. That was, that was a good time to be know who the lineup was. Tina Fey and Jimmy Fallon. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they were all there. I, and I was sat there when Jimmy Fallon auditioned. I watched Jimmy audition. I watched, wow. you know, Horatio Sands, Sands and Chris yeah. Parnell yeah. audition, and a bunch of other people who really. They may be famous. Who's done I okay. <laughs> right. And then, but I was there when Tina was just a writer on the show. And she wanted to be on air, and, and she worked hard and was able to get herself on air. Same thing with Jason Tudakis. Jason started as a writer on the show and ended up becoming, he wanted to be on camera right. and got on camera and now ended up being like a movie star. He's on the edge of truly being a movie star. So yeah. I learned a lot about comedy there working there because you're on the production staff. I didn't work in the legal department, I worked at the show. I was in the hall. Like my office was three feet away from Seth Meyers' office. I, you know, like we just would hang out and talk. So a, wow. a few weeks ago, I interviewed uh, Mike Shoemaker. Who is Mike Shumaker uh, from SNL? From, from SNL, Jim? yeah. Because how'd, how'd you find Mike? Well, he, he hired me. He's he, my is that right? Really? Wow, what a small world. Yeah, yeah. he he co-created a show called uh, The Awesomes, which is on Hulu. Yeah, and they do it with Seth. It was Seth Meyers. Yeah, yeah, I remember so. when he was pitching that. I worked at Center Live. They pitched that, and I, I was just, pitching shows. That's hilarious. And I talked to Shoemaker, and he goes, he would pitch this cartoon show. <laughs> and I think they actually had a deal at another network first. Okay. Or at least interest. And they did. I, I, I heard something on NPR. They, so how do you get Shoemaker to agree? Because he's hard to nail down. Well, he, he's at Seth's show now, right? He left. He was at Jimmy's. He left SNL. I was at he's, SNL. He's with Seth. He was my boss, technically. I knew... I, I, Lauren Michaels was technically everyone's mm-hmm. boss. Right. But that's not who you work for. I mean, you work for his name. But then there was Ken yep. Amok, another guy who you guys won't know. But Mike was the boss from the creative point of view of all okay. of us. So I had answered to Mike. You know, sure. Something. Could have been happening. Talk to him, Dr. Mike about it. and uh, so it was really. He was a great guy and gave me a chance. He didn't really want to hire me at first because I was like 31 or 32, and like, and my first job was going to be a receptionist. But with the okay. idea of being that the person who was going to leave, who was going to take, who was doing rights and clearance, and he's like, I don't, you know, you really want to take this job? Like, he's like, you really want because I was going to pay like four hundred dollars a week. It's horrible money. Yeah. And this was 19, late 1990s. It's horrible money. <laughs> And then it's not like horrible money. Yeah, we're talking about the nineteen fifties. We're talking about <laughs> exactly. like, it was late night and living in New York was oh, horrible money. Yeah. And I said, no, this is I want to take a chance and I have no problem taking this risk. I can always go back and be a lawyer if things don't work out. So Mike gave me really a big break there. Wow. So he really kidding. helped me in my career. And I keep in touch. I mean we email every now and then. I don't really have lunch with him in a while. Yeah, the the show, uh, the awesomes, uh, the director of the show is my very good friend, Sean Coyle. So oh. uh, I was I was best man at Sean's wedding, so they very went to close friends. Oh, that's great. School together, yeah. So um, I was basically like, Hey dude. Oh no, Shoemaker <laughs> was my boss. I worked for Shoemaker. So I called him Shoe and, and he would and he was <laughs> the guy. And he would and then he left. I left a short time before him. Then he left and went to Jimmy's show to start okay. a Jimmy show. Sure. And then he left to go to the, the late show. night show. Not right. Not tonight, no, tonight. no, he didn't go over to tonight. In fact, yeah. I bumped into Mike about a year ago in the halls there, and he had just left Fallon to go to, to, to help develop. So at that point, Seth had not left. It was still in he development. Was in, he was going to be. The deal was made. It was announced. But Seth was developing. So, wow. and the, the coolest thing at SNL was seeing the trajectory of fame, like meeting yeah. people like yeah. Jimmy, That's who right. nobody knew, and Seth. And Tina, and people who went on to be household names, nobody knew them. They came yeah, in just as right. well, talented people. The, the question I asked uh, Mike a few weeks ago is the same question I'm going to ask you. Can you share a Lorne Michaels story? <laughs> well, see, Mike worked with Lorne every day. Mm-hmm. You know, and Mike would hide from Lorne. <laughs> <laughs> because Lorne's very demanding at the level Mike is at. Mike was like second in command of the show when Mike wow. was there by the end. So Lorne was the boss. And Lauren was more hands-on than people thought. And, mm-hmm. You know, it really, really was. My stories, were, I, I had very little daily interaction with Lauren. A few times I'd cornered him in the elevator, but in the elevator, so he was forced to talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I would use those moments just to chat with him. You know who I was. was sure. like, not that big of a staff at SNL, frankly. Right. Uh, but there wasn't, more like, I remember something like Mean Girls just come out. I'm like, oh, okay, right, great. He's like, yes, right, yes, what, well, well, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> I'm like, is there a sequel? Maybe, you know, we'll see. <laughs> the young girls like the movie. That kind of stuff. That's a pretty good impression. It <laughs> is. I still better impression because he was there. You would hear him talk. <laughs> it's not like right. everyone did a Lauren impression. <laughs> that was the deal. Some people like Mike Myers have made a lot of money off oh of their Lauren impression, right? <laughs> so, I mean, being in SNL, I mean, obviously many names have passed through it. Who were some of your sort of comedic, you know, like some of the legends you looked up to and inspirations that you had when you started your career? I think it's... For different different people for different reasons. Right. Like Robin Williams, 
Uh, my comedy's not at all like Robert Williams. It's frantic, and his, is, his I mean, his comedy's frantic and disjointed. Mine is much more almost modern like it's really structured. But I love that his he taught you the idea of the freedom to really take chances on stage and bring things to life in a way I never would have thought of. And, and I had the opportunity to meet him a couple of times. In uh, he was in a Broadway play, and my fiance is an actor. She was in the same play with him, The Bengal Tiger, wow. The Baghdad too. Wow. So I got to meet him a few times, and actually he was a great guy. Like within a minute, he be, just became a comedian. He was not, I don't mean he performed, he just t- started talking about comedy, about the comedy club and the world of comedy, because he knew I was a comic. Cause my, my fiance said, well, my, you know, my guy's a comedian too. Right. He was a great guy, and he was really nice. Yeah. Um, so Rob, for comics from the content are more like Jon Stewart, even as a comic, but mm-hmm. even John on a show, Chris Rock, Richard Pryor, even Lenny Bruce, even though most people don't know Lenny Bruce much, and Bill Hicks, I like both them a Bill great Hicks, deal, but yeah. they they push the envelope on comedy, going into areas that no one thought you would ever touch. Richard, Richard Pryor. Certainly maybe. Richard Pryor with race. If, if it wasn't Richard Pryor doing that for race, I don't think I could talk about Muslim and Arab issues. Right. I feel like, what are you doing? You're not supposed to do this. And then... You know, for work ethic, there's other people like Jim Gaffigan. You know, I started comedy with almost with Jim. He started a few years before me, but we were in the same circle. We worked really hard. And even Will Ferrell, who wasn't a stand-up comedy, but Will Ferrell was like, he was the star of the show at SNL, but he showed up five minutes early for his call time. He was hmm. there the latest every show, wow. every for rehearsal, right. never screwed around. He would joke around, of course. Right. But his professionalism was an example for anyone else coming up there. You could be the star of the show. You still, you should still be professional because there are others who become divas. There were people at SNL, sure. who I won't name, but who became, you know, they show up late for rehearsal, and everyone has to wait for them. And and I saw on other shows too, not just SNL, other projects I've worked on. So different people for different reasons. Uh, so you so you talk about 9/11 as being kind of a, a nexus point where the focus of of your comedy changed to an extent. Right. Um, can you explain that? What 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 was what was your sort of process like as as this transition? And you occurred? mentioned nexus. I mean, you're really at a nexus in terms of your own sort of you know you're you're, you're an Arab in New Jersey. Happens in your backyard. I yeah, mean, I lived in New York at the time. I mean, wow. I was so I was downtown. This is oh one so in the West at Village time, yeah. um, at the time, right. and I saw the second tower collapse. I mean, from about three quarters of a mile away. I mean, I was on the street watching. So. It was, you know, I knew that was a traumatic moment because I knew something was going to change. I didn't know it was going to affect me as much as it did and that my whole world. Before 9 11, no one identified me as an Arab guy, Arab comedian, Arab American, anything. I was just a white guy, frankly, white lawyer guy, or at the time working at SNL. Right. And some of the SNL people knew I was Arab, whatever they asked, what kind of name is that, and they would joke around and stuff. But then. And a few months after 9-11, the few jokes I did about being Arab, I didn't even do. I was hmm. I was weary of talking about being Arab um, on stage. Because mm-hmm. people in New York City, someone had a family member or friend in those audiences that so, lost somebody. Yeah. So it was a really difficult time. I didn't know how to navigate through it. And after a few months of thinking about it, even a club booker, who was a friend of mine, said, you might not want to talk about being Arab on stage. Oh, wow. It was like a week after 9-11 when the club's finally opened. And he said it in a way to be protective of me, not to censor me. He just didn't think it was going to be safe or helpful for me. Right. A few, year, for months, a few months after 9-11, I started noticing changes. The world, like the world would change. And me, I changed. People would say, things, what kind of names are Obidal? And before I would say Arab or Muslim. After 9-11, I became self-conscious when people would say that. And, I, and that was my first jokes were about that. Like credit, paying with a credit card. And someone said, what kind of name is this? And instead of saying, like, Arab or Muslim, I'd just be like, you know, difficult to pronounce or, you know, things along those lines where you start dealing with this tension. It's just diffusing it, like, yeah. Yeah, because you really don't want, because it's going to start a conversation. Yeah. A good or a bad one, but it's going to start a conversation. No matter what, you're going to have a conversation in the the months after 9-11 in New York and you said your name is Arab or Muslim. Hmm. It's going to have a conversation. So true. And so, then, so little by little it started to creep into my act and then, Probably a year after 9-11 or so, it became much more conscious choice of me, myself to, to talk about it more. Like, I, I really have an opportunity. I really wasn't on TV then, but the media was starting to come to all of our shows. Because I was producing the different shows at the time, just like shows with Middle Eastern American comics. There weren't that many in New York. We'd put them together, and people would come out, and the media... So, like, two years after 9-11 was the first shows we did. Is and that the, ex, the X? No, that, that's years, years later. Oh, really? Okay. So that was... 
I was going to say accents of evil comedy tour. No, like yeah. Middle East bazaar or something oh. like that. We just call them random things. Yeah. And then, then three years after 9-11, we created the New York Arab American Comedy Festival. Me and my friend Mason Zayed, and we created that. And that, so then now it's 11 years. It's, it's 11 old, years. Old future guest, yeah. It's going to be yeah. 11th anniversary, like next week of the mm. festival. It's our 11th festival. It's wow. not that is like, awesome. Two weeks from now. So it so it became a bigger part of my comedy, about my identity as a person, um, and then it became a cause for me as well to talk about it in a way to try to combat. There was not even a word Islamophobia, but just right. to combat misconceptions. Because at that time, it really was more ignorant. Now it's much more malicious. We were now talking about that on the last show about things. Like, things have yeah gotten coarser in in the media. The kind of the, yeah. That's a good way of putting it. That's an almost polite way. It's become... It's worse now. I mean, I wrote an article for Daily Beast on 9-11 anniversary 13 years later. It's worse. And that's just not, not my attitude. Poll numbers. Oh, yeah. Americans' view of American Muslims is down to 27% approval, favorability rating. That's American Muslims, not Islam in a vacuum. Of American Muslims, other Americans only 27% look favorably. Now, still the upside is that you very small percentage of advocating any kind of loss of rights or civil liberties, but when those numbers get that negative, that's where that the next step comes, which is the Fox News people saying there should be no more mosques in America. Literally saying that on air. Bob Beckel said that. He's the liberal. He's the liberal, right? right. He's the liberal. And you have that more. You have that kind of talk, and now you have Republican elected officials openly saying stuff. Yeah. Like Oklahoma, this guy John Bennett, who I wrote about, a state representative, uh, yeah. said American a- Islam is a cancer. American yeah. Muslims should be cut out of this country. Seems like a nice guy. You know, it, it's well. The worst is the state Republican chairman backed them up. So yeah, Oklahoma's a special place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where the stupid get elected, really. Um, so I think it's more. People used to ask questions. Now they don't ask because they think they have the answers, and the answers aren't correct. Huh. And so now wow. it's much harder to uh, to jog them from holding onto that one answer. That's right. To get a new answer in there that's correct. I mean, I get an email today from some guy. I don't even know. I write these articles. I get emails all the time. I get an email today from some guy. If you're a real moderate Muslim, which I don't use that term. I think it's the stupidest term ever. But if you're a moderate Muslim, do you agree to this or that? Or yeah. this or that? Like, like some, some kind of litmus check, test. Check the, yeah. these boxes. Well, yeah. People tell me, oh, are you a moderate Muslim? Are you a good Muslim or a bad Muslim? I'm like, I'm not. I'm, I'm a Muslim. That's it. I'm not moderate. I'm actually really progressive politically. But there's there's mainstream Muslims, and then there's teeny percent that's radical. That's it. Yeah. You know, and mainstream could be anything from someone who just identifies as a Muslim culturally, like so many of my Christian and Jewish friends, to those who are devout in my mind, who pray five times a day, like some of my cousins do, some of my family members, and go on Hajj. You know, we're all mainstream. There's no moderate in there. I don't. I think moderate is a sense that if you're a conservative Muslim, you might be dangerous because you pray a lot. And to me, I don't like that. That's just my own view. Yeah. Well, no, I, I, what, what you're talking about, sorry, is is th- this idea of how from from 9/11 to now, if we're to, on a continuum, things in, in, at least in terms of the discourse, things have, has as we said gotten coarser. Um, what do you attribute that to? What do I? I think there's a few factors involved. I think they've come together in a perfect horrible storm. Um, You've got one is some some is terrorism. You can't discount that there are terrorist acts com- committed by people who identify as Muslim. They might not be Islamic, their acts. They might be, not be consistent with the faith, but they are Muslim. That's you right. can't take that away. And I don't mean ISIS. I mean years of stuff have been going on from the Boston Marathon bombing right on our own soil mm-hmm. uh, to attacks across the world, to people being arrested, to the Fort Hood shooter. So if you didn't have that, I don't think you can demonize a minority without having some objective, some piece of information to use. So they latch on to the terrorism. Then, So once you have that, then you've got people on the right, Republicans use it, fear-mongering, it, try to get them votes. Some people make a living from it. People write books on it. They make lectures. They go out there. Um, that I think that's a, that's a component of it. And I think entertainment media as well has painted this negative, negative image of Muslims and Arabs with very little counterbalance. And to me, though, the biggest factor of all was a poll number that came out in July. Over 60% of Americans don't have a Muslim friend, don't know right. any Muslims. They don't know anyone. So there's no human counterbalance. Like, we could see a Christian globe at an abortion clinic, but I know that person doesn't represent Christianity because I have tons of friends who are Christian, and they're That's not right. like that. But if you don't know any Muslims, and if you think about it objectively, forget your faith. If you don't know anything about Muslims, and all you do is watch the news, yeah. and you see negative image after negative image, because there's no positive images of us, really. 
Sure. Why are you not going to think the worst? How could you? How? Well, it takes a special person to actually research on their own yeah. to learn about a culture and not demonize us if they don't have a human counterbalance or at least a media counterbalance. So that's the world we're in. Where so all these factors, but to me the number one factor, if you had to boil it down, is we don't have enough of us. Mm-hmm. Which I want to start like an adopt a Muslim program. Like everyone adopts a Muslim it's a friend. <laughs> Like adopt a highway and everyone has a Muslim <laughs> friend and you can ask us questions. I, I was on MSNBC two weeks ago. I said that thing. I'm like, you don't have a Muslim friend. I'll be your Muslim friend. Um, I, you know, I'm not going to help you move, but you know, on Twitter <laughs> or Facebook. And people, a lot of people, it's a liberal network, ta- and added me on Twitter. Oh, wow. And I said, I'm happy. I'm, I'm honored you're my friend. I told them. I'm like, thank you. I said, if you ever have a question about Muslims, don't listen to Fox News or the far left don't listen you know the funny things don't that's the problem I think another you've got from the far right to the far left well and 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 uh, you talk about appearing on on MSNBC and and something that you mentioned on our way uh, to our conversation here was uh, the need to shore up the, the liberal yes. uh, base I was wondering if you could unpack that a little bit because I think that's very that's an interesting comment well I think that well here's the one big picture in, in this world of political demonization we're demonized by Republicans, but we're not defended by Democrats. You That's don't right. have Democrats right. standing out for us. So if you demonize gays now, you're going to have liberal Democrats standing up instantly. Um, Nancy Pelosi, right from this area. You know, you're know, you going to have elected officials saying this is wrong. People demonize Muslims. I don't think most Democrats agree with it, but they're not going to go on. They're not put their neck out for us. They're not going to do anything about it. They just sit back and let us get beat up. So you have that. Then, So then when the, the more the ideological continuum, you have conservatives who demonizes for a vast array of reasons, from really being afraid of us to hating anything different than them, anyone that doesn't play like them, to being fearful that some Muslim might kill them, to whatever. I don't even know. Yeah. You would think the liberals would be the counterbalance, and they are in a certain degree, but like Torre on MSNBC last week yeah. said, among liberals, Islamophobia for some is acceptable. And I that's saw wrong. That. Yeah, I saw that. And that was really good. And, I, and I'm not a big fan of something Torre says. I was a very big fan of that. And I've had many conversations with executives at both CNN and MSNBC about trying to have more Muslims on the network and how it's important and that we're an, un, an underrepresented community, but it's really a, a thriving, vibrant community, which is generally above middle class. Yeah. Good, from a just business point of view, because the argument for them has to be business, not like, you know, please help us. Please help these poor Muslims out. We're having a tough life, you know? Right. It's got to be the same thing with others. So, so if we lose liberals... We don't have really anybody really wow. fighting with us. Because moderates aren't bad, but they're just sitting back. They're, they're moderates. That's what they do. Do you want to take a, do you want to take a break while we eat? Or do you sure. Know? It's up to you. You're going to just keep going? Okay. Wow. Look what I got. Can I mention this on the podcast? <laughs> I got a bread sandwich. Look how big the chicken is. <laughs> <laughs> this it's is all pretty bread. big. <laughs> It's all bread and it's, it's all bread. The chicken. That's right. And I'm going to put it all on the one sandwich and turn it into a normal sandwich. Can I swap you guys any a couple of these for a couple of those? Oh, please. Yeah, did no? did yeah. you not want the sweet potato fries? No, I do, but I don't want... I just want a few of every... I'm not gonna please, because I'm not going to eat all this. This is way I don't... All right, we better keep talking. These people are going to turn off the podcast. <laughs> I'm talking about food. <laughs> like good Muslims were eating we'll chicken, edit, honey, eating no, this is all going to be edited out. Right? Oh, I think it's funny. I it no, I, I don't. <laughs> now lunch corner. <laughs> um, now it's it's almost like this has been talked to death to some extent, but I feel like it is worth at least mentioning the the, the nexus of a lot of this conversation. When we talk about the left, is of course what, what Bill Maher said um, or has been saying. I should say it's a, it's it's part of a, part of a series. Um, I think I think what's 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 interesting to me at least is the dichotomy between how. Uh, Bill Maher, in a very real sense, his career was impacted by the comments that he made uh, after after 9/11, uh, and and not that I would want to see his his career impacted by the things he says now, but I do think it, it's it's very telling that there's far more people who are in agreement with him uh, making sort of controversial comments about Muslims. I don't know if it's far. I saw more backlash for those comments and yeah. because Ben Affleck was so passionate. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, Ben Affleck may not have offered a lot of substance in response. His passion woke a lot of liberals up. I saw a lot of articles like in Slate. A lot of articles written by non-Muslims about Bill Maher. 
Um, and, and I think that was really good. We were calling him out. Chris Hayes on MSNBC saying, how could you not have a Muslim on the panel? Yeah. I was on Ed Schultz's show when Ed was out, but Professor Dyson uh, oh, was sure. oh, hosting. Wow. Yeah. And another guy, on, another African-American professor, both said, how could you talk about Muslims not have a Muslim on that show? You know, it's like having... I said it's like Fox has five white people talking about African Americans all the time, <laughs> but the problem is Bill Maher's analysis is much more like a Fox News analysis. Like pick the worst examples and try to define oh, yeah. that community by that, and it's something that he would rail against if it was any other community, and that's really the problem to me. And I also think it's really interesting that I haven't seen any Muslims. I mean, they might be somewhere in the country. I haven't seen any mainstream ones or any one in the media. Write articles like Bill Maher should be fired. Get him off the air. You don't. You see more like, come on, Bill, you're better than that. Because a lot of, you know, the Muslims who follow him are probably more progressive than like myself. Agree with him on so many other issues. They're like this is ridiculous. This is what makes it more painful. Mm-hmm. Well, it's this tremendous blind spot. It's intentional by him. I mean, uh, can you explain that? He thinks he's doing a service for the world by calling out. Like I think in his mind, it's like, um, they must call this out. And I wrote about it for the Daily Beast. I'm like, call out all you want. If you want to talk about human rights issues in Muslim countries, I'm fine. But keep, aware, keep in mind, the people watching are not the leaders of the Muslim countries. It's other Americans. And here we're a minority faith. So what you say causes so true. human consequences to here in the United States of America. It does. It doesn't get the Saudi ruler or the Pakistan leaders who you really want to change their policies. But that's really your goal. And that's really your goal. I mean, this, Bill Maher gave a million dollars to Obama. Give some money to some organiza- human rights organization that's fighting to change laws in 13 Muslim countries that make it a crime to leave Islam. Um, I even give money for that. I think the idea of it's a crime. The idea of Islam, there's no compulsion in Islam, is one of the most important principles and tenets. So how could you have a law saying you ha- you're going to be killed if you leave Islam? It doesn't make sense to me. And that's why out of almost 48 Muslim-majority countries, 13 have it on the books, and almost none of them apply it. We almost had that case in the Sudan with the woman. Mm-hmm. And they right, right. not putting her to that. They prosecuted her, but mm-hmm. it's just... She becomes a relic of a day gone past. Gone. Well, I mean, t- talk about um, the work you are doing to make a difference. I mean, I think I think the Muslims are coming. Obviously, is is one of the most visible uh, examples. How, how did uh, how did that come about? Well, that was me and my friend Nikin Farsad. Can you just stop? Thanks, Nikin Farsad. She's a uh, Iranian American Muslim. And we had worked on other projects together. She's great. She's a comic. We did stuff at Comedy Central. I did a one-person show years ago, and she directed it. And we were just talking about doing something to try to combat what we saw. It was in 2010. We really had to proceed for this, and that's when the Ground Zero Mosque protests were going on. Yeah, we both live in Manhattan, so mm-hmm. we were seeing it. We couldn't believe this in Manhattan. There's stuff going on. So we said, part of that so few people know Muslims, we said we have to go out and meet people. And... At first, we talked about doing a tour, but she made a couple of documentaries before. She said, "Why don't we turn it into a film?" So we're going to raise money. Then we go, "How much are we going to charge?" Like, well, we can't charge people. We really want to meet people who will never come to our shows. So like, okay, we'll do all the shows for free. Then we have to raise all this money to pay for the comics, pay the comics to go, mm-hmm. we travel, rental. So we spent about eight or nine months raising money. And then we went on our tour. We went to the South, we went to Georgia, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama in Florida and then we went out to the west a few weeks later in Utah and Arizona we did free shows in communities in red states trying to meet people and do these shows answer questions we set up tables on the streets of certain southern states like ask a Muslim a question or play a game called name that religion we read quotes from the New Testament the Old Testament the Quran see if people can guess it <laughs> and it's anything violent they would guess it's from the Quran but of course in our little game it was mostly from the Old Testament and the New Testament <laughs> And they were shocked. Mm-hmm. And we knew the devout Christians didn't even know what's in their book. And, and that was sort of the point. That, you know, you could be a, a, an amazingly devout Christian. You're not following everything. It's not like you cherry pick the books. You're going to have to play this game all day with any faith. It's, so we filmed it and it premiered about I mean, two years ago at the Austin Film Festival. And then 
we played last fall at the Sun in five different cities. We didn't get to play in San Fran. We really tried to get a theater in San Fran. But, and then it's on iTunes, and now it's on Netflix. So who can watch on Netflix? What, um, what surprised you during the process of making that film and going on the tour? Isn't it? On the tour, um, the most surprising thing for me was that every place we went, if you had questions for us, the number one question asked in every place was, why don't we see Muslims announcing terrorism more? <laughs> oh, every place, every place. Wow. I go, are you serious? I go, we down to all the time. They're, they're not seeing it. And these weren't hateful people. These were just like right. people who were like, some of them trying to be helpful. Like, you know, you got to announce terrorism more. People know that. I was going to talk you. And that was a wake-up call for me because I'm like, who still wants to hear this? And it really is. The average person... They're not watching, you know, if you watch a news story about a beheading, that covers for three days, the news, right? Or two days. Yeah. A Muslim group denouncing it might be on a three-minute segment, one time, not news cycle. So, there are many Americans who don't hate Muslims who actually think we deep down agree on some level, or that it's actually part of our faith, and that we don't speak out because we know it's part of our faith and we just don't want to say anything about that. Meanwhile, we're trying to do everything we can to speak out. That was the one... And the second thing was all the celebrities at the time from their schedule to be in the film, like John Stewart and Rachel Maddow, Louis Black, and Colin Quinn, and, um, and Russell Simmons, and Keith Ellison, and a whole bunch of great celebrities. It took time to be in this film, and of all of them, only Keith is Muslim. Yeah. The rest are just doing it because they believe they're against bigotry against any group mm-hmm. and want them to stand with us. You know? So, like, and, and we, we we've talked, Zucky and I have talked about this before. Um, you were talking about like again, you know, people like people not seeing Muslims denounce terrorism or not in our name or what have you. And I get that from a, like from a sort of a utility point of view or the utility of that. But philosophically, I guess I it still I, I struggle with it just in the sense that why should I right? Mm-hmm. Why should I as an American living here who has one no say in what's happening in some part of the world? Right. Why should I you know why should I have to denounce it? Well, I know there's a split. Where do you sort of come there's down? There's definitely on? a split with people. Yeah. Until I went on that tour, yeah. I was in your camp. Uh-huh. And after that tour, I'm okay. like, we really have to do this. Because they really, they sincerely believe, not even bad people, not right. bigots. Right, Really believe that because they don't hear us in the mm-hmm. media, that somehow we agree with it or it is part of our faith. Mm. And before that tour, I never, I'm like, I'm not going to, what the hell? I don't know these guys. I'm going to say anything about them. But. Okay. Okay. That's a grassroots thing. Really, people really believe it. So here, here's here's my question then. The denunciations are happening. We know that. This time more than ever. From Boko Haram, from Boston, I think, the Boston bombing, Boko Haram and ISIS is ne- I've never seen as much. But ISIS has been amazing. The denunciation. Even the media is... Fox News even mentioned it once. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> but but even, even so, it seems like a lot of that is not getting through the, the noise barrier. So it, are we doing it wrong? Like, what, what's... What's the approach that we need to take? We need rich Muslims to buy networks in America. <laughs> right. Where's Muslims, our Rupert Murdoch? At the, Muslim, the Muslim Denunciation Network or something like that. Um, NBC. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. For me, the biggest thing I think to change things, because we can't increase our numbers, frankly, in, in the near future, is getting in mainstream media as a regular part of rain, not just uh, I mean, just terrorism. I was, and I'll give you one example. It's anecdotal, but to me it was interesting. Um, there's a show on Sirius XM Radio that I guest host, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guest on all the time. My friend, stand up with Pete Dominic. My friend Pete Dominic has a show. And I'm on a lot. And Muslim issues come up, and I've talked about it and denounced it and read my art, talked about my articles on air. And they had a guest host about a month ago, my friend Rick Unger, who's a liberal guy, he's a really nice guy. But he said, why don't we hear Muslims announce the terrorism? Mm-hmm. And you get all these people tweeting to him, going, don't you hear Dean? Dean's on the show all the time. He does it. Because yeah. Rick doesn't know when I'm on the show. And so Rick's like, so Rick emails me and goes, why don't you come on the show? Right? When I was, like within a half hour. I'm like, what's going on? Yeah. And I go on and we talk about it. And because I was a regular part of that show, that audience knew there was a Muslim guy who's been on numerous times who's denounced terrorism, made it clear what, what we're about. Mm-hmm. If I was on the show once, only when there's an incident, that was not going to do it. So if there were Muslims on American TV, more so, and identifying as Muslim, 
that just made part of society. They're not denouncing terrorism, they're just Muslims. And you get to know that person. The same way people got to know African Americans with the Cosby show. I mean, it's really... Right. So... Or, 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 like, I think the Jewish community and, and Jewish comics, like you mentioned, sure. Lenny Bruce, I mean, you know, Jerry Seinfeld, I mean, it just, you know... John Stewart. John Stewart. John Stewart. Yeah, yeah. People who were just, you know, one, identified one, themselves as being Jewish. And one thing I, I've been advocating for for a long time is I, I would love to have Law and Order with, you know, Detective Abbott, who's just, you know, no, you know, it's right. not like, oh, hold on, i got to drop some rakats, but it's just we know... His background, and, and that's it. It's part of the makeup of the character. We and talked about, um, like, you know... In, Saeed, in, in, Or that, in Zero Dark Thirty, where you had, you know, mm. the uh, one of the CIA, like, mm-hmm. one, of the, one of the higher-ups, he was a Muslim, he was like a white convert, who was Muslim, and right. film. But it's not, it's not really... They don't hang a lampshade on it, right. like, oh, hold on a second. No, yeah. that would be He's, the best way. Yeah, that's... Right. I mean, generally, you see now, at Homeland, you'll have... This season seems a little different, but last season was definitely like all these bad Muslim actors and one good person who ends up getting killed generally by the bad ones. You know, that's what happens. Um, If if we were just part of the fabric of society, just, oh, that guy's Muslim, no big deal. Like Aziz, I'm sorry, his name is Muslim, he doesn't identify as Muslim at all. But, you know, he does make people more comfortable with him. Aziz Aziz is not that far anymore to young people. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, I see. Point. Like, I'm sorry. I agree with you. It would be great to have... It doesn't have to be like an all-Muslim show, either. Just, you know, characters on different shows. Right now, most of the characters I know who go on shows, they're playing like the Muslim guy. And it's the episode where there's almost always terrorism involved. Right. On some level. Like, I think, I think your buddy, uh, Mos Jabrani, had this... Mas. Yeah, Mos, sorry. Mos Jabrani had, had this bit where... It's like, you know, he's like training, for, he's like doing like an acting school where all the audition is like for like a terrorist oh, yeah. or a I guy or a guy screaming. Oh, you oh wrote wow. That? Yeah, yeah, that, that was wrote, hilarious. That was, the, that was for a Comedy Central pilot that That's I, right. I oh, co-created okay. with my friend Max Brooks. And we, Max Brooks as in not Mel Brooks' son. World yeah. War Z. As World War Z? Yeah, we're, we're, like, buddy. we're like big geeks. <laughs> of like I know, World Max and my friend. We created, we worked at SNL together and then me and him went to Comedy Central and pitched and we produced this internet series called The, the Watch List, which is before Access Vivo. It was the first time a network, a mainstream network, put Middle Eastern American people on air. Some are Muslim, some weren't, but they were all Middle Eastern ah. or South Asian. No, I think all Middle Eastern, no South Asian. Mm. And then we went to pilot. We did the pilot. So that was from the pilot. And I wrote that sketch and directed it. That was hilarious. Um, that was a great bit. With, with Maz, was, you know, the star of that, and he really brought it to life. But we didn't get the series, so we just put it on YouTube. That's where I saw it. It was it was hilarious. Yeah. It all That's comes all. back. To, see, it all comes back. That's <laughs> to me somehow. It's all me. <laughs> well, you are the subject of the show, so yeah, it's and, appropriate. Yeah. Okay, so uh, th- big thanks to, to Dean for for coming and hanging out with us, and you can find him online at the Dean's Report. Dot com and and he is of course on Twitter and and uh, on on Facebook and and a lot of other places. So so uh, check out his his media presence. Uh, you'll you'll find him uh, uh, witty and wise. Absolutely, that was it was it was, great, it was a great uh, conversation that we did have. Um, so yeah, no, thank you again for listening. Uh, we've actually been uh, uh, like like Zaki was saying at the outset. We've got some really good responses, um, and uh, some have taken the time to write us. Yeah, so here's a here's a new review that went up on uh, on iTunes, and this was posted by uh, the name is Omar oh. A and Siri. Uh, hope hope I pronounced that right. Uh, he said this is the quintessential podcast about the Muslim American experience. Well, thank you. Uh, Muslim Americans contribute to the U.S. in more ways than people realize. They are your doctors, lawyers. Former lawyers, I'm just going to put that out there, and government workers. They entertain you through sports, literature, music, and media. They work tirelessly as community organizers and in NGOs to make the United States a more perfect union. In this wonderful, eye-opening podcast, hosts Parvez and Zaki document some of those uh, uh, c- contributors in the form of captivating interviews. I hope you get a chance to join in on the conversation. Highly recommend it. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, Omar. Um, you know, uh, I, I almost feel like I know you, so thanks for writing that and taking the yeah, time out. I appreciate that. 
So that being said, that brings us to the end of... Oh, and by the way, if, if you have any uh, comments or, or questions or concerns about anything that we're doing, you can, of course, leave us a review at iTunes. You can also leave a comment on our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. Oh, you can also email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can also uh, send up smoke signals, semaphore. <laughs> Basically, there are many ways to, to reach us. We're not, we're not hard right. to... We're not hard to find. Uh, that being said, uh, Pervez, where can people find you online? So uh, I'm, well, like like you said, we're, we obviously check our Facebook page. Um, I'm also on Facebook, Pervez Ahmed. Uh, and I'm also on Twitter, at uh, New Madhab, uh, M-A-D-H-H-A-B. It's, it's, it's very easy to spell. He, he, he was very forward-thinking when he picked his, his Twitter feed. <laughs> Uh, you, you can find me on Twitter at, at Zeki's Corner, that's the A-K-I-S Corner, and also at the Huffington Post, where my movie reviews go up regularly, as well as my other podcast, the Movie Film Podcast, uh, as well as this podcast. Which so, I think we also are upon another anniversary, right? You just celebrated 10 years of blogging? I, that's or, right. Sorry, Zucky's Corner, right? Been yeah, up for 10 years? 10 years. 10 wow. years. I started my blog because I was very upset that George W. Bush got reelected, uh, but in, in a in a... Very specific way, I'm grateful that he was reelected because uh, I don't know that I would have started writing if not for that. So, and, and again, I say in a very specific way, I'm grateful that he was reelected. Uh, that being said, so that, congratulations. No, thank, thank you very much. Yeah, time, time, time flies when you're having fun. So uh, that wraps up another episode of Diffuse Congruence. We we'll look forward to speaking with you next month. Hopefully, you will be joining us for that. Thanks. 